So that was pulmonary ventilation, right? Just bringing the air into the lungs and pushing the air out of the lungs. Once we bring the air into the lungs, we have to allow gas exchange to occur. Again, this is the actual trading or exchange of oxygen and CO2 between the air and the blood. Okay, so the air in the alveoli and the blood in the alveolar capillaries. So remember, the air comes into the alveoli, right? And when we looked at the alveoli, remember we had these little alveolar capillaries, right? These little blood vessels that were surrounding the lungs. Right, so the air comes into the alveoli, the blood's flowing through the alveolar capillaries, and we need to exchange those gases. We need oxygen to go into the blood and CO2 to go out and into the air. When this gas exchange occurs, it occurs across something called the respiratory membrane. This membrane that the gas is have to cross is the respiratory membrane. This is a very, very thin membrane. Right? If diffusion is going to happen fast enough, it's got to be really thin. The membrane is made up of a couple cells that are fused together. So we have the squamous cells that line the alveoli. What did we call those? What type of pneumocytes were they? Type? Type one or type two? One. Those were pneumocytes type one. The type two or septal cells, what do they make? <coughs> they make surfactant. Okay. So, the pneumocytes type 1 or type 1 pneumocytes are just these structural cells that line the alveoli. And they're simple squamous cells. Right? So one layer of flat cells. The capillary, remember, is lined with a really thin endothelium. Right? Just endothelial cells. So what kind of cells are endothelial cells? Like are they a cuboidal, columnar, squamous? Squamous. Okay, so that lining, the lining of the capillary is another simple squamous. So we've got a really flat cell and a really flat cell. And then their basement membranes are fused. So we essentially have two very, very thin cells and we fuse them together. And that makes for a very, very thin little membrane uh, that the gases have to cross as they're exchanged between the air and the blood. When we look at gas exchange, we'll see that it depends on, one, the diffusion of a molecule between a gas and a liquid, right? And that's kind of different, right? This is a gas in the air, the blood is a liquid, so we have to see things cross between the air and the liquid. Um, and then what's gonna be really important to us are the partial pressures of the gases. Okay, so partial pressures of the gases. Um, because the atmospheric air, the air we breathe, is actually a mixture of gases, it's not just pure oxygen that we're breathing. Um, it's a bit more complicated than that. So here's where another law comes in. Again, I'm not gonna ask you to like memorize the names or reproduce the laws, I just want you to understand them so that you can understand how it works in the body. Dalton's law has to do with partial pressures. So Dalton's law says that when you have a mixture of gases, like the atmosphere, all different gases. When you have a mixture of gases, each of the gases contributes to the overall pressure in proportion to its abundance. Okay, that sounds kind of complicated. But remember, gases exert pressure, right? So the atmosphere we said was 760. That's the total pressure of the gas. But we said that the atmosphere is a mixture of all different gases. So what Dalton's law says is the partial pressure, the pressure of each individual gas, so oxygen, the partial pressure of nitrogen, the partial pressure of water, the partial pressure of CO2, those are all in um, proportion to their abundance. So the more oxygen you have in the gas, the more the partial pressure of oxygen is. The more nitrogen, the more the pressure of nitrogen is. Okay, that makes sense. The more of something, the more the partial pressure of that one individual gas is. And all of them should add up to the total pressure. So let's talk through this. Again, the atmosphere, the air we breathe is a mixture of gases. Okay, it's mostly nitrogen. Um, but we have nitrogen, okay, um, oxygen, a little bit of water vapor, and then a little bit of carbon dioxide. Okay, mostly nitrogen and oxygen. This is how much, right, the composition of the air, how much of the air. So if we looked at all, this is a gas, so I've got a bunch of atoms and they're bouncing around like crazy all around us. If I looked at all of these atoms, 
the majority of them are going to be nitrogen. Okay, again, about a fifth of them are going to be oxygen. So we also said that the atmospheric pressure totals, right, the pressure of all of it combined is about 760 millimeters of mercury. That pressure, again, is from all of these atoms. It might be from a nitrogen, it might be from oxygen, it might be from CO2, it could be any, from anything that's bouncing around. That's the total pressure from all of the collisions that exist. Now, what Dalton's law says, um, or what the partial pressure is telling us, is that the pressure or partial pressure of nitrogen okay, is relative to how much nitrogen we have. So 78.6% of this is because of nitrogen. The 20.9% of this pressure is because of oxygen. 0.5% of this pressure is because of water. 0.04% is because of CO2. So if you multiply that out, that tells us that out of this total 760 millimeters of mercury that the air is pushing in on us, 597 is from nitrogen. So the partial pressure of nitrogen is 597 millimeters of mercury. The partial pressure of oxygen is 159 millimeters of mercury. Does that make sense? So all of these partial pressures should add up to equal the total pressure, right? Um, here are the partial pressures for everything in the atmosphere. I did not add them up, but if you add these up, hopefully they equal 760. <laughs> Just to kind of get your bearings, you guys, on like, where we're at or what life matters or whatever. Um, pulmonary ventilation. Remember to breathe <coughs> ventilation. Just bringing air in and out. That looked at total pressure of the gas. Right? So like atmospheric pressure, not individual gases. Total pressure of the atmosphere versus the total pressure of the gas inside our lungs. But when we look at diffusion of gases, so like the diffusion of oxygen, the diffusion of CO2, in and out from the air to the blood and back and forth, that is gonna look at the partial pressure of each individual Okay, so total pressure gets the air into the lungs. Then we have to look at each individual partial pressure to see where it's gonna diffuse. Okay, so the last law just kind of gives us information or explains how it is that the oxygen is going from air to liquid or how the CO2 bubbles out of the liquid and goes into the air. Um, and what this says is when a gas is pressurized, okay, so we've got like, like air or whatever kind of gas is put under pressure, it can actually dissolve into a liquid, right? So we can force bubbles, if you will. We can force gas to go and get into solution, right? To go into a liquid. Um, and the more pressure we put on that air, the more of it is going to go into the liquid. Okay, so think of it like a can of Coke or some sort of a soda. That's pressurized, right? When it's carbonated, we take carbon dioxide and we pressurize it. We put it under a bunch of pressure and we force that gas to go down into the liquid and then we seal it to hold it in. What happens when you decrease, when you to open it, you're decreasing the pressure, right? Now it's atmospheric pressure. So what happens when you open that can of soda? The gas escapes, right? The gas comes out because you decrease the pressure. So now the gas bubbles out again. You pressurize a liquid and you can make that gas, or sorry, you pressurize a gas and you can make that gas go into liquid. Okay, so the point here is that gas can enter liquid as long as it's going from a high pressure to a lower pressure. Okay, pressure will push that gas into a liquid. So this is why it works when we're looking at like oxygen going from air into the blood. 
the oxygen gas will go into the liquid as long as there's higher pressure in the air than there is in the blood. <laughs> Just like a chemical. All right, so there are a few kind of key things that all go into making sure gas exchange occurs efficiently in our lungs. One, we'll see that there are big differences in partial pressure across the respiratory membrane. So what we mean is that there's a big difference in partial pressure between the air in the alveoli and the blood in the alveolar capillaries. And again, we're talking about partial pressures. So we would look at the partial pressure of oxygen, right, in the air and the partial pressure of oxygen in the blood. Or the partial pressure of CO2 in the air versus partial pressure of CO2 in the blood. So we're being specific, looking at partial pressures, and we're comparing what's in the air versus what's in the alveolar blood. The distances involved in gas exchange are very, very short. Okay, so why? Why is, why is this distance so small when we look at the respiratory membrane? What are we looking at there? Okay, well, what, what, what makes the alveolus small, small distance? The membranes are thin. Membranes are thin. Tell me more specifically if you're going to tell me technically. Simple squamous cells, right? Remember the alveoli and the capillary are made up of simple squamous cells. So we've got two very, very thin cells fused together. So it's a very short distance. It would not work if we had columnar cells or cuboidal cells or stratified cells. Um, oxygen and CO2 are lipid soluble. What does that tell us? Why does that matter for diffusion? <laughs> Perfect. They don't need a protein, they don't need a channel, they don't need a pore. They can diffuse straight through membranes. Total surface area is large. What do we have to think for that? What makes the surface area so big in the lungs? So there are a bunch of capillaries. And then what about the actual, so that makes the blood portion a lot of surface area. What makes the lung portion have a lot of surface area? The alveoli. The alveoli, right? We've got millions of alveoli and they're covered with tons and tons of capillaries. Both components are important um, to have enough surface area between the air and the blood. And then finally, blood flow and airflow are coordinated. Okay, we'll see that we alter um, airflow in the lungs and we alter blood flow in those capillaries um, on a local basis. It's controlled locally to make sure that we're bringing air where it's needed and we're bringing blood where it's needed so that everything matches up um, to a good efficiency. When we look at pulmonary gas exchange, okay, the exchange of gases that occurs in the lungs, we're looking at the diffusion of oxygen and CO2 between the alveolar air, right, so that's my alveolar air, and then the blood in my alveolar capillaries. Okay, so I'm looking at the exchange of the respiratory gases across this membrane here between the air and the blood. We said that when we look at gas exchange, we're looking at what kind of pressure? Total pressure or partial? Partial. partial pressure of the individual gases. So first we'll look at what happens with oxygen. The partial pressure of oxygen in the air is about 100 millimeters of mercury. The partial pressure of oxygen in the blood is about 40. And what did we say? When we put a gas under a high pressure, we can make it go into a liquid, right? We can just like carbonating a drink. We can force that gas into a liquid. So the oxygen is gonna go from where to where? Where? Good, so the oxygen is gonna enter into the bloodstream, right? Oxygen diffuses from the air into the blood. So then when we look at CO2, the partial pressure of CO2 in the air is 
40. The partial pressure of CO2 um, in the bloodstream is 45. So now this is like opening the can of Coke, right? When you open it up, the bubbles go back out, right, into the air because it's less pressure. So this CO2 goes from high pressure to low pressure and CO2 goes from the blood into the, into the alveoli, into the air, right? And then we exhale. So again, all about pressure, high pressure to low pressure. When we look at pulmonary ventilation or pulling air in, we look at total pressure of the entire thing, all the air, all the atoms. When we look at gas diffusion, we look at the individual partial pressures of the gases. So remember after um, we just had external respiration, right? We bring the air in, we have gas diffusion occur in the lungs. Now I've got this nice oxygenated blood and I let what system take over? cardiovascular or circulatory system, right? I let the cardiovascular system pump that oxygenated blood out to my body. Then when I get out in the periphery of the body, out to my tissues, that's when we have internal respiration occur. Okay, so that's the gas exchange that occurs out in the periphery. So this is between my systemic capillaries. Right? I've got blood out of my systemic capillaries. I've got my cells. And what's the fluid that surrounds them? And I have that interstitial fluid. So I'm gonna have oxygen and CO2 diffusing between the blood and the interstitial fluid. Okay, because remember the cells produce the CO2 waste, right? It leaves with the cells and goes to the interstitial fluid. And then from there, we're gonna wanna take it up into the bloodstream. So oxygen, <clears throat> once we get out to the systemic capillaries, the partial pressure of oxygen is a little bit lower. Um, than we saw in the alveoli, um, in the air. So we see the partial pressure of oxygen is about 95, and the partial pressure of oxygen in the interstitial fluid is about 40. Okay, it goes from high to low. Right, we've said it a million times. So the oxygen is going to leave the blood and go to the interstitial fluid. Then remember, the oxygen will go from the interstitial fluid into the cells. The cells will use the oxygen to do what? Make ATP. Make ATP. Okay, they'll make the CO2 in the process. So when we look at the CO2, CO2, partial pressure of CO2 in the blood is 40, in the interstitial fluid is about 45, so it goes from what to what? High to low. And we pick up more and more and more and more and more CO2 <laughs> as we head back and back and back and back, yes? What causes the partial pressure of the blood in the capillaries to increase from the lungs when it gets out into the the partial pressure of what? Oxygen or CO2? Uh, of oxygen. The partial pressure of oxygen, well, in the lungs is, we're talking about like as it goes into the lungs before it's picked up the oxygen. So like when you look here, like when you're, you're saying oh, okay. as like 40, so we're assuming like the deoxy blood. Yeah, that's the blood in the capillary. Coming in. Yes. Yes. Yes, 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 exactly. Just because it's kind of hard to measure it at one point in time, but. Theoretically, yeah. Okay, so we said that we control airflow and blood flow locally, right, in the capillaries and in the bronchioles in order to kind of maximize the efficiency of our gas exchange. So we see that the smooth muscles in the alveolar capillaries is sensitive to the partial pressure of oxygen. Okay, so we have receptors that are constantly monitoring the partial pressure of oxygen that's coming in in those, um, the alveolar capillaries. When oxygen is low, that means that we don't have a lot of air in that area, right? Like if I have the alveolites coming in and I've got this capillary right here, if this capillary is monitoring oxygen concentrations, and it sees that oxygen concentrations are really low, that means it's not getting much oxygen from this air, right? It should be getting a lot, but if it's not, there's no reason to have blood coming here. It's like, why bring blood to an area if there's no oxygen to even pick up, right? So that would tell this capillary to constrict, and then that's gonna divert the blood flow to other areas of the lungs where you might have more oxygen present. 
So the smooth muscle in your bronchioles, right, the tiniest little tubes in your bronchial uh, or your respiratory tree is sensitive to the partial pressure of CO2. So when that partial pressure of CO2 goes down, that bronchial constricts. Because remember, like the air coming in, the job of this air coming in is to pick up CO2 from the blood to exhale it, right? That's the whole job. So what this is saying is if there is not CO2 in this air, there's no point in exhaling it, right? You're essentially exhaling good air. So if you want to constrict this bronchial and divert the air to say over here where maybe this blood has a lot of CO2 to pick up. Okay, so the air is only going to the places where it can pick up CO2. The blood's only going to the places where it can pick up oxygen. So you can coordinate blood flow and airflow to make this as efficient as possible. Okay, we're actually gonna finish. <clears throat> so these last couple slides, guys, just address the different ways that we control respiration centrally. So we have numerous different respiratory centers present up in the brainstem. This should be taxic, not taxic. The pneumotaxic center. Um, the pneumotaxic center is present in the pons. And then down in the medulla oblongata, we've got the respiratory rhythmicity centers. Um, the respiratory rhythmicity centers include the dorsal respiratory group, or DRG, and the ventral respiratory group, or VRG. That's just dorsal and then like the back ventral as far as the belly side of the medulla. Okay, so we've got the pneumotaxic center in the pons, and we've got the DRG and the VRG down in medulla oblongata. These are constantly monitoring the blood as well as the cerebral spinal fluid and then adjusting our respirations, either the rate that we are breathing or the depth that we're breathing based on first pH. Remember we said that we alter our respirations first based on pH, then the partial pressure of CO2, which remember directly relates to pH, then the partial pressure of oxygen. And we said that the caveat here is that if you've got somebody with some sort of a pulmonary disease, they're gonna be monitoring on that partial pressure of oxygen a lot more. So the ventral respiratory group, or the VRG, again, is in the medulla oblongata, and this controls the motor neurons that go down to the diaphragm and the external intercostals. What do we use the diaphragm and the external intercostals for? Inhalation, right? When you inhale, you use the diaphragm and your external intercostals. The VRG is what's controlling them. Okay, so the ventral respiratory group sends the signal that says inhale. Sends the signal, inhale. Sends the signal, inhale. So this functions during every respiratory cycle. Okay, this determines your basic respiratory rate. So however fast the VRG is firing, that's how fast your basic pace is to breathe. Okay, that tells you every time you're supposed to inhale. I remember that because VRG is every, right? Every cycle, VRG. Every time you inhale, the VRG sends the signal to the diaphragm and the external intercostals to inhale. The dorsal respiratory group, which is also down in the medulla oblongata, controls the motor neurons that go to the accessory inspiratory and accessory expiratory muscles. So remember that you only utilize these when you start breathing kind of like more deep or more heavy than normal. Okay, you utilize those accessory muscles to expand even further than you normally would to pull more air in. So you utilize the dorsal respiratory group during deep breathing. Again, DRG, the uh, when you do deep breathing. So the ventral respiratory group during every respiratory cycle. The dorsal respiratory group via when you utilize deep breathing. The pneumotaxic center um, down in the pons is when we adjust respiratory rate. So what this does is it actually sends signals to the VRG and adjusts it. So the VRG says inhale, 
Inhale. Inhale. Then you attack the center. We'll say a little bit quicker, please. So that it starts going like this. I mean, not that you don't breathe that quick, but or so that it slows down. And again, that happens based on your blood and your cerebrospinal fluid. Right? So if the blood, if the blood ends up getting too acidic, okay, if you have acidosis, so you have too much hydrogen, um, what do you think you need to do? Breathe faster or slower? Think it through. Good. Why? You need to blow off CO2. Okay, because you need to blow off CO2. Remember, the hydrogen is over here. We go through that whole buffer system, and CO2 and water were on this side. So if I'm acidic, I have too much of this, so what I need to do is get rid of this, and I'll pull some of that away, right? Um, what if I were alkalotic? If my pH was too basic, I would have too few hydrogen ions, right? So I need to push it this way. So what would I do? Breathe more or less? Less. Okay, I need to conserve that. Um, so like if someone's hyperventilating, if you force hyperventilation, you can actually force um, alcohol by, by blowing off too much CO2. Um, this is just kind of FYI. So this thing, we've got a lot of different ways that we can adjust respirations. So sometimes we adjust respirations based on um, our chemoreceptors. Right, so we just said we're constantly monitoring pH and CO2 and oxygen, and we can adjust how deep we breathe and how fast we breathe to correct those things. Um, we also adjust how deep we breathe based on the stretch receptors that are present in like the bronchi, the bronchioles, the actual, um, the pleura, the lung tissue. We've got stretch receptors, and as we expand, as we inhale, the more we stretch, the more we stimulate those receptors, and they'll actually send signals to inhibit those motor neurons so that you don't inhale too much, so that you don't overstretch and damage the lungs. Um, we also have things like sneezing and coughing um, that are triggered whenever irritating physical stimuli or chemicals like dust or pollen or like heavy bleach, any sort of chemicals that irritate the respiratory tract will stimulate um, that kind of, like again, sneezing or coughing, um, mucus even, so like running in the tract in order to try and get rid of those physical stimuli that are irritating. Um, and then other things can also affect respirations. So pain, stress um, affects respirations, which is why I say like, take a deep breath to calm down because you tend to hold on to that um, when you're stressed out. Exercise, it's interesting, even just getting ready to exercise increases respirations. So like if you have a routine, right? You, if you grab your water, you go to the door, you tie your tennis shoes, and then you run. Getting that, like that Pavlonian response. You know, getting your water and going to tie your tennis shoes will increase your respiratory rate. Because the body knows like this is what's coming. Let's start to get that oxygen to go off that CO2 now to get ready. So there's a lot that affects respiratory rate. Woo! We did it, guys. <laughs>